Welcome to our monthly lunch break series that's put on by the Christmas Tree Council of Nova Scotia. Just a note on our lunch break webinars, they are now pre-recorded and put on our YouTube channel. If you want to reach out to Jillian Blackburn at outreach at ctcns.com, she'll be able to add you to the mail list to notify you when these sessions come out. So this month's lunch break webinar is covering our phosphorus dip trial results as well as our spongy moth monitoring program that was put on last summer. I am Leanna Hoig, I'm the acting Christmas tree specialist with the council. So in the summer of 2021, the CTCNS research team conducted a phosphorus dip trial that was located in the northeastern region of Nova Scotia. Uh, One-year-old balsam fir seedlings were used that were obtained from Scott and Stewart Nursery, and this, this trial was to measure the effects of phosphorus on seedling establishment. Uh, we established this trial in June, we did a midway assessment in August, and the trial end was in October. So getting into why phosphorus is important for plant growth and why we decided to put this trial on. First and foremost, phosphorus promotes protein synthesis, which is ATP during photosynthesis which in turn promotes cell division and development of new plant tissue. It also promotes root growth and winter hardiness, especially in conifer species. It increases early growth and establishment, meaning that it helps plants reach maturity at a faster rate. Uh, phosphorus is very mobile in plants, but fairly immobile in soils. And a lack of phosphorus can lead to stunted growth in the early stages of establishment, as well as discolored foliage. So we put on this trial because the thought process there was if you treat your seedlings with a phosphorus slurry and you plant them, then they have a better uh, chance at establishment and success. So getting into the actual logistics of the trial, the experiment included application of 0, 1, 2, 5, or 8 grams of 0460 phosphorus fertilizer dissolved in 1 liter of water. The root plugs of the test trees were submerged in the solution for either 5, 15, 30, or 60 minutes, and we also had untreated controls that were planted at the same time. We had 100 trees in this trial. Just a quick note on the site that we used for this trial. Again, it was in the northeastern region of the province. It was a recent cutover that is now planted with balsam fir to be used as a Christmas tree lot when they grow up. We sectioned off a small area for this trial. So in terms of parameters that were taken or data that was collected throughout the duration of the trial, we looked at the mass of the seedling, the overall health of the seedling, so does it have good foliage, does it have good color, do the roots look good, the height of the seedling, the length of the roots. So for plug trees, we looked at the length of the roots that were protruding from the root plug itself, and we also took the number of roots that were protruding from the root plug. We also took the mass of the roots, so the weight of that root plug without the tree, and we also took pictures of before and after. So here I just wanted to show a quick example of the before and after photos. So this tree, 35K, 35 is the number, K is the treatment. That's uh, more important later on. But uh, as you can see, the first photo on the left hand side is when the tree before the tree was planted in the ground. So you can see it's quite tender foliage, the root plug, there's a few roots protruding there, but then the after photo you can really see that uh, the uh, stem has lignified there, it's uh, strengthened up, it's got some woody tissue in there, as well as the number of roots has really increased as well as the length. So that's what we really wanted to see throughout this trial, overall for seedling establishment, but also to see if this trial actually was successful. So getting into the analysis of the results. You can see in this photo, this was after we dug up all the trees in October of 2021. We brought them back to Scott and Stewart Nursery so we could easily measure the parameters that I had previously stated, and those were used for analysis. So in terms of the analysis, we used the R program with the Innova and Tukey analysis, and we tested for differences in seedling mass, seedling height, root length, root number, as well as root mass. So now we're going to touch on the actual results of the trial. So the results from each parameter that we compared from the beginning of the trial to the end. So for each of these parameters, we did come up with a graph. Each of them contains the same information, which is uh, the min, the median, the max, the standard deviation, as well as outliers. So each graph contains the same information. 
So starting with seedling mass and seedling height, there was no significant differences between the beginning and the end of the trial between any of the treatments. So although seedlings gained mass and although they gained height, there was no significant differences between any of the treatments throughout the duration of the trial. Now getting into the roots, we're going to be looking at root length and root number. So starting with root length, there were significant differences in length among treatments, but there was no significant differences found between specific treatments and our control trees, which is really what we want to see. We want to see a, a, a difference between a tree that has no treatment compared to those that do. And here uh, we did have differences between treatments E and B, where E had uh, 2 grams of phosphorus fertilizer in 5 minutes in solution. B had 1 gram of phosphorus fertilizer in 15 minutes of solution. There was also differences between P and B, where P was 8 grams of phosphorus fertilizer in an uh, hour soaking in the slurry, where, again, B was the 1 gram in 15 minutes. There was also differences between treatments L and E, where L was 5 grams of phosphorus fertilizer in a 60 minute slurry and E again was the 2 grams of phosphorus fertilizer and 5 minutes in the solution. So really where there, there was significant differences found between those treatments but where there was none tied back to the control we can't say there was a whole lot of differences there. Pretty much the same thing can be said for root number. There were significant findings between specific treatments, but none that were significantly different from controls. There were various treatments that did contrast one another, but again, where it wasn't significantly different from the control, there is no significant findings there. And on the last parameter that we collected for, which was root mass, we can also say that there was no significant findings. So no difference, no, no significant differences, sorry, between treatments and controls found for root mass. Getting into conclusions of the trial, we're going to step back for a second and go back to the site characteristics and conditions that the trial was put into. So here again we have a recent cutover that has numerous species coming up, red maples, goldenrods, some asters, various other species there. Uh, the trial area was outlined with these logs and here on the right hand side we have the resulting soil test from that location. And here you can see this red arrow points to the available phosphorus at that site. You can see that it's very low at 29 kilograms or hectare. So for Christmas trees, ideally your phosphorus levels, you actually want them about 175 kilograms a hectare. So this site, extremely low phosphorus for us to be planting trees into, but where we did run this trial and we put trees in the ground that had been soaked in various concentrations and times of phosphorus. So they had phosphorus available to them for a short amount of time at least. It didn't make a difference in establishment of the seedlings. A few more closing remarks before I move on to the next lunch break topic. So overall, again, there was no significant findings from this study. There was no combination of concentration of 0460 fertilizer, phosphorus fertilizer, uh, that we submerged the trees in for various amounts of time that actually made a difference in seedling establishment. So again, the site that we had used, it had very low phosphorus fertility anyways, so we can kind of attest that once the trees were planted in the ground where there was such a low concentration of phosphorus already in the soil, a diffusion happened. So basically the slurry and the phosphorus that was deposited in the ground with the trees during planting diffused into the soil likely. We can also say that after a tree is planted, there is usually a period of acclimation for the tree itself. So typically in the first year, not a lot of growth happens anyways. The trees are typically a little bit stunted. So where we didn't see significant results from that, if we were to do the study again, first I would likely like to see it go into an area where the phosphorus was a little bit higher as well as look at a longer term study where this trial only ran from May to October. 
But overall, this was a very interesting study to conduct for us because we hear about growers using this method quite frequently with success. So this isn't to discourage anybody from uh, doing that practice, but just in terms of uh, the actual success of it over a short amount of time at least, that we didn't find any significant findings. But if, if people do have success with this, by all means, keep doing it. But uh, in terms of saving some time and labor, perhaps take a look at this study to see if it's actually worth your while. So thank you for taking the time to listen to the phosphorus dip trial results. And now I'm going to switch gears and talk about our Okay, so welcome back. This is our second lunch break topic of the month. These videos will be tied together, of course, so uh, if you were just interested in the phosphorus dip trial results, then by all means, you can stop listening here, but if you're interested in our gypsy moth monitoring program and the results from that, please continue. So the team here at CTCNS conducted a gypsy moth monitoring program during the summer of 2021. I would just like to take a second to acknowledge a recent name change that Gypsy Moth had undergone. So it is now known as Spongy Moth. So throughout this, the rest of this presentation, I will be referring to it as Spongy Moth. Just a bit on the history, this pest arrived in Massachusetts in the United States in 1896 from European countries. Egg masses were then found in British Columbia in 1912. It then moved east, causing infestations in Quebec in 1924 and in New Brunswick in 1936, and it has since moved into the remaining Canadian provinces. I'm sure most of you at this point have heard of the devastation that this pest can cause, and it has, it has a very wide range of uh, foraging or, or feeding habits. It can uh, feast on about 500 different species of trees alone. That doesn't include any shrubs or herbaceous plant material, but it is not limited at all to what it can, can eat. There, and there's no evidence in North America, per se, that these outbreaks occur on a periodic basis although populations tend to exist in four different phases. There's the inoculus phase, the release, the outbreak, and the decline. So the first phase, it consists of low population levels. The release phase, it takes about one to two years, and this is where population density begins to increase. The outbreak phase is when the populations are high enough to cause severe defoliation and damage. And the decline phase, which is where high levels of spongy moth mortality are, are observed. And this is typically due to starvation and disease. And then the population crashes. In terms of regulation, spongy moth is regulated by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, where this pest is typically a hitchhiker. It attaches to, to wood, to products, to vehicles, to everything. It is easily distributed through areas, and uh, that's how it uh, is so successful as a pest. The regulation falls under the Federal Plant Protection Act as well, and CFIA has been conducting monitoring since 1954. Some states in the U.S. and Canadian provinces conduct aerial control programs. British Columbia has launched a program, had launched a program in 1975 to eradicate or reduce spongy moth populations and has been working at that ever since. All right, so there is various life stages of spongy moth. So beginning in May and June, defoliations of needles and leaves results from the caterpillars feeding in the spring. And this damage window typically occurs from May to June, and all stages of larvae will feed on foliage. So this is an extremely early pest, especially where in Christmas trees we don't typically have one that is so devastating so early in the season. So keep an eye out early in the year for this pest to occur. In July, the larvae will find shady areas to pupate, and adults will emerge in July. The females themselves, they're too heavy to fly, um, but they will create egg masses of anywhere from 100 to 1,000 eggs per egg mass. The males will fly during this time, but after the females produce these egg masses, they typically die within a day or two. These insects overwinter in the egg stage, and there is a virus that acts as a natural predator on the female, but not the male. 
So with this, we have identified that there is a need to monitor for this insect in Nova Scotia. So CTCNS began a program working in accordance with Perennia as well as Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture to produce uh, homemade traps with a pheromone lure that uh, any Christmas tree grower or woodlot owner could take home to monitor the levels of this insect within their own lots. So in May of 2021, our CTCNS research team, as well as Perennia and Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture, as well as Nova Scotia Community College, paired together to create these traps. We constructed 300, which were then distributed across various uh, NSDA offices throughout the province, where growers could pick up the traps and report their findings in a citizen science program for us to review results. So since bungee moth is already in the province, it's very important that we find ways to monitor population levels. And these DIY traps allow growers to monitor numbers of spongy moth at a very cost effective rate. So just touching on the actual construction of these traps. So the materials that we use, we use a two liter bottle, whether it be a pop bottle or a juice bottle. You can visit your local recycling depot if you're interested in um, constructing some yourself, some scissors and knives, uh, twine, screw eyes to be able to hang the trap, tape, spongy moth, pheromone lure, which there's information on where to get those on our info card if you're interested, water, dish soap, disposable gloves for when you're actually handling the lure. So now on how we assembled the traps. First off, you want to make sure that you start with a very clean bottle. Of course, you don't want to be working with uh, any old recyclables anyway, so just make sure those are uh, really rinsed out good. We then cut four slot holes at the, near the top of the bottle within the top third, typically at the widest point of the bottle. So the hole should be approximately three centimeters in length and about one centimeter in height. Then we then removed the bottle lid and we punched a hole through enough for a small screw eye where we either attached a screw eye or we attached twine through the hole and we tied a knot at the desired length so you had a loop to be able to actually hang your trap off of. Um, the, this is where the pheromone lure actually attaches to as well as underneath the cap. So this is where it's step four here it says secure a piece of gypsy moth pheromone lure to the inside of the lid and this can be done by taking a small piece of tape and attaching it to the underside of the lid and again be cautious not to cover the entire lure with tape as it needs to hang down from the lid slightly. This is where you would want to be using those disposable gloves as you don't want the pheromone lure actually on your skin. And just a little note on the pheromone lure itself. So typically they're a couple inches long. You want to keep them in the fridge when you're not using them, but you can also reuse them for a season or two. So uh, when the lure is out during the summer, when you pull your traps in uh, the fall, you can take that piece of pheromone lure and put it in an airtight container in a freezer. But you can also cut the lure into multiple lengths and uh, just to increase the longevity and use of that lure. Once you get your lure attached, you want to put a couple inches of soapy water at the bottom of the trap. This is just to ensure that once the spongy moth enters the trap, it'll get down into the water and it'll trap it so it's not able to escape. These pheromone lures only attract the males. Once traps were assembled and distributed to growers, we asked that they hang them in their Christmas tree lots and for them to weekly monitor them. So they would go out and to refresh the water, but also to take inventory on how many gypsy moths were actually in the trap. And we also asked that they reported back to us um, on an online Google form. So we received numerous responses from that. As you can see here, this is the result of one trap here. I believe this was in our Sefernville experimental lot. Quite a few spongy moths there. The overall objectives of this program was to develop a pilot monitoring program exclusive to Christmas tree lots in Nova Scotia to collect a baseline data on the risk of spongy moths present to Nova Scotia growers, as well as to increase awareness of the importance of pest monitoring in Christmas tree lots through a simplified monitoring program that includes the concept of citizen science to growers through online data reporting. And the last objective was to encourage collaboration between growers and industry so to support groups and demonstrate the potential of collaborative knowledge and technology transfer. 
All right, so now we're going to talk about the results from our monitoring program. So as I said earlier, we produced 300 traps. We only distributed about 58 throughout Nova Scotia. So next year we're going to look at uh, distributing traps to more than just Christmas tree growers and include woodlot owners as well as Christmas tree growers and anybody else that wants to be a part of this program. That will just be a part that's added on to uh, the reporting process. So from those 58 traps that were distributed, only 32 traps were reported on or that we received information back from. And from those 32, only 15 traps had reported numbers. We had 101 reports submitted through our Google Forms. This image on the right hand side, so this was the uh, head, header of our uh, Google Forms page where growers could come report their numbers from their monitoring. It's also important to note that uh, the CTCNS research team had these traps up at each one of our smart tree evaluation sites, so there was nine traps out of the uh, 32, 32 traps that were reported on that were from the CTCNS research team themselves. Let's take a look at uh, the traps that reported the highest numbers. So as I said earlier, the out of the 15 traps that we had numbers reporting off of, we had three of those were from our smart tree evaluation sites through CTCNS. So the first one here, these are cumulative numbers of moss that were collected at, through the whole entire monitoring program. So throughout the period of about two months, Sefranville saw about 70 spongy moss that landed in the lure, in the trap, sorry. And uh, from there, we also had our Wolf Fill Smart Tree Evaluation Site, which is located in a plantation style lot, which is an old hayfield. Our Bars Corner lot is also a Smart Tree Evaluation Site, but is also plantation that started as a hayfield. This one, trap 220, this one's interesting because it's not located in an active Christmas tree lot or even a woodland, but it does have fur on the property. It's at the exhibition grounds in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. But there is a slight decrease in the number reported there. Uh, the other, the last two lots that are reporting lower numbers, but they were in active Christmas tree lots. I find this interesting, but I'm I'm thinking that the reason that we got higher numbers for these lots was because we were uh, out at these lots once or twice a week. We were frequently visiting and changing out the water and making sure that the traps were uh, upright and um, in an appropriate location. So I think I can attest those higher numbers to that, but also I'm not upset seeing lower numbers at the other sites because that, that's a good thing. And now for closing remarks on our spongy moth monitoring program, I just want to reiterate that this was a citizen science program, so we were really trying to encourage and motivate growers to take these traps, place them in their lots, monitor them on a weekly basis, collect data, as well as report that data back to us. And I understand that that can be a big undertaking, so... Um, in terms of the inconsistencies in reporting, uh, getting into the fall, it's, it's, it's quite hard for growers to to be able to do this as well as manage uh, their Christmas tree lots as well. So um, it's I do really appreciate those that took the time to collect data and uh, make sure that those traps were out. Um, we did receive some results, but I hope that in this next year that we can expand the range and the distribution as well as those involved in the program as well. So not just Christmas tree growers, but woodlot owners as well. And even to have people have these traps on their properties, like even near their houses, or uh, anything along those lines, just so we can actually get uh, a baseline of what's actually out there. I just want to note that the majority of the findings, the majority of the spongy moss that were found in the province were all within the Halifax and the Lunenburg counties. So we did have traps in the northeastern region, but we uh, really didn't get much back in terms of spongy moth numbers, which is a good thing for those in the northeastern regions. Uh, these uh, Lunenburg counties tend to be a little bit warmer. I don't know if that would have an influence on the number of pests right now or not, but um, again, next year we hope to distribute more of these and expand the program a little bit, so um, we hope to just get a little bit more information back that we can work with. And I just want to take the last couple minutes to thank the groups that were involved in the 
production of this program. So the Christmas Tree Council of Nova Scotia, Perennia, the Nova Scotia Department of Agriculture, as well as NSCC. So all of these groups helped collect bottles to, to make the traps, to assemble them, as well as to distribute, as well as our, our resource assistant on our CTCNS team, Jillian Blackburn. She uh, put together the Google Forms for growers to be able to report back their numbers. That was extremely helpful, and she had answered many questions, and I'm pretty sure she uh, had a lot of phone calls as well to enter the data manually herself, so a big thank you to everybody there. And uh, on a side note, if anybody has any questions about this presentation, please feel free to reach out to myself, Leanna, at uh, research at ctcns.com. And where I stated at the start of the Lunch Break series, if you want to be added to the mail list to figure out when these Lunch Break series are released, please reach out to Jillian Blackburn at resource at ctcns.com. And I hope you enjoyed this video and the information presented. And I look forward to seeing the next Lunch Break series. Thanks a lot and have a great day.